So this is the second video we want to do of early Christian heresies, and it's about the Montanists. This one's, um, <laughs> it's all very ripe, and the quotes from many of the church fathers are incredibly colorful. Uh, one of the reasons that I started, not started reading them, but I would read them and say, check that out, is because they write with a level of, uh, of pizzazz that a lot of uh, Christian writers today just don't want to engage in. So I have a quote here from you from Tertullian. And Tertullian is important for a number of reasons, one of which is he eventually becomes a Montanist. But I want you to hear what he says about heresies first. All heresies, when thoroughly looked into, are found to harbor dissent in many particulars, even from their own founders. He's saying one of the characteristics of heresy is that they can't agree with each other on core principles, and they usually don't even agree with the people that started their movements. The majority of them do not even have churches. Motherless, houseless, creedless outcasts. They wander about in their own essential worthlessness. Could you imagine a preacher actually saying that today? He goes on. In their discipline, we have a measure of their doctrine. They say that God is not to be feared. Therefore, all things are in their view free and unchecked. I was in a church service 16 years ago where the preacher was preaching about Job, and he kept saying over and over and over again, we don't need to fear the Lord because we're in the New Covenant. If that's not Montanism or some shade of Montanism, I don't know. And I, I waited. I stayed in that service for 35 minutes of this guy preaching to make sure I didn't misunderstand him. And as he became more and more articulate and clear about how we don't need to fear the Lord anymore, I left, got up and walked out of that room because I was put in mind of when John is supposedly, or Polycarp, met uh, one of the early heretics and fled from the building because he didn't want the roof to fall on him. So early heresies, uh, the Montanists. What were the Montanists? Oh, wow. Okay, so the Montanists were a group of uh, people. Uh, Montanus was the leader, and he had uh, two women who were his assistants, so to speak. And Montanus was claiming to be the paraclete, to be the Holy Spirit to be some kind of incarnate Holy Spirit. Now, let me say this is kind of difficult to, to parse because in the case of the Montanists, unlike the Gnostics and other Arians and other um, false doctrines of, of long time ago, most of what we know about the Montanists isn't from them. It's from the people who are writing about them. So we have to take that in proportion because how often do we misunderstand you know, someone we don't agree with and we misrepresent their thinking? Okay, so let me just kind of say that. Uh, but Montanist was accused of claiming to be the paraclete because he would say things like that. And he would say things like, don't follow the word, don't follow Jesus, follow the Holy Spirit, follow the paraclete, follow me. And he and uh, I believe their names were like Priscilla and Maximilla. You can look it up and find some good research on it. These two women were prophesying about how the new Jerusalem was going to come down out of the sky in a place in Arabia. And they would see angels, and they would prophesy, and they would have dreams. They were known for their ecstatic speech. They were known for a, a, a whole lot of spiritual manifestations um, that were so characteristic of what they were doing that then they would point, take the finger and they would point to the rest of the church, and they would say, you're not really Christians because you don't have these manifestations. And to put this in perspective, the Mont Montanism starts in the mid to late 100s. This is still really early. And we have accounts from other Christian leaders and bishops that they still were seeing prophecy, exorcism, healing, the raising of the dead. Uh, Irenaeus writes about this. Some scholars have said that uh, Irenaeus was probably a Montanist because he writes about it because they don't believe that the spiritual gifts, the charisms of the Spirit really continued after the days of the apostles. That's not true either. But Montanism is a different thing. Because what did they end up doing? They created their own churches. They created their own ministers. They put up their own bishops and their own concept of priesthood. They created their own concept of the ministry with its own organization, keeping the books of Scripture, and then saying, you must have these, these phenomena if you're really going to be part of Christ's church. Just thinking about that as it pertains today to so much of what's going on in what we could call like a neo-Montanist approach to the church. And so here's a question just for you to think about and chew on. If 
Johnny come lately, living in the somewhere in the mountains or somewhere in the plain states or anywhere on the world has an experience, a spiritual experience. It's a profound experience. And then goes out and starts to preach and advocate that experience and calls people to himself and to that experience and says, this is how we worship God. So in the, in the span of 15 to 25 years, Johnny now has 10, 20, 30, 40 churches. And there are people exhibiting and demonstrating particular charisms, what they think are charisms and manifestations. But Johnny won't take what he's doing and reconcile with the rest of the church. He's going to be in charge of that. And he's going to reinterpret and define what the New Testament says and what the whole of Christian tradition has said and say, this now is the church. How do you think most Christians today would respond to that? In Christian history, they respond to the Montanists, you know, very strongly. And I, I tend to think that amongst the Montanists, there were well-meaning people, just like today, who were having legitimate experiences with the Holy Spirit. But their approach to walking in the Spirit and experiencing the Spirit was in such a way that they were alienating other people. So if we can see that in the, the Gnostics, in the, the, the other video that we've done, that they denied the efficacy, the efficacy of the sacraments. In the Montanists, we can see an overemphasis on particular spiritual expressions, good spiritual expressions, but an overemphasis of them to such an extent they've rejected the rest of the church. And in rejecting the rest of the church, they've created their own. As in the case with just about every heretical movement, they typically don't last but a few generations and in some cases, they will last several hundred years. Uh, we, we get to doing a video on the Arians, you'll just see that, you know, that 600-year window where they're, they're pretty effective. They, they can last for a long time. Um, but with these Montanists, I want you to think about that. I want you to, to, to look at Scripture. What does Scripture say about the gifts of the Spirit and how the gifts of the Spirit are, are to operate and how uh, God wants us to respond to Him with that and look at the church around you today so that you can make sure you're really staying with the Holy Spirit and not a spirit claiming to be the Holy Spirit.